Uh, Peter somehow brought me into this strand called Dancing with Death. Uh, so I thought I'd give it a go because I thought you might be interested in, you know, how is jazz dead or has it moved to new address came about. Um, although it was published in 2005, it's come back to haunt me time and time again because I've lost count of the number of universities and colleges and got it on their recommended reading lists uh, in Europe and in the United States in places like uh, the New School in Manhattan, uh, Duke University, um, Gerald Irby's uh, course in Washington, <coughs> and so on and so on. Um, so uh, two years ago, the book was used as the theme for the Portland Jazz Festival in the United States. It's jazz day, it's moved a new address. Uh, four or five years before that, it inspired a strand on European jazz and the North Sea Jazz Festival, where um, my only claim to fame is that uh, I was on the same program as Ormette Coleman and uh, Gary Burton, uh, Chick Corea, uh, Bill Frizzell. And if you look down the program, right at the very bottom, you'd see me, and uh, I was doing a workshop on, on this jazz dead, themes from this jazz dead. So that's, that's my only claim to fame. Um, so what I thought I'd do, I'd just tell you about how the book came about, because um, uh, keeping following the strand of uh, everyone telling their secrets, I thought you might be interested in how it came about. But more importantly, uh, since the book came out, which as I said was in 2005, um, you, just, you just don't sort of switch off and go to sleep and work on something else. Um, I've had more ideas and more thoughts on a key chapter in the book. So I'd like to just go into those after I've just very briefly told you how the book came into existence. And so to begin at the beginning, um, on Sunday the 3rd of June 2001, the Arts and Leisure section of the New York Times opened with my feature, and it was called Europeans Cut In with a New Jazz Sound and Beat. Um, the German magazine Der Spiegel later, later said, which I thought was quite amusing, uh, to American ears, this sounded like the Russians were coming. <laughs> a few months later, I got a phone call from um, an editor of a major book publisher in New York. I'd worked on him with him previously, a fantastic guy, uh, very talented, and of course, like all uh, ambitious men, he goes onwards and upwards. And he'd moved to a, a new publisher, and I'd lost contact with him, but he'd seen the uh, article in the New York Times, and he'd seen the discussion it had provoked, um, and he said he'd like to work on another book, uh, which was good news for me, because um, I'd been planning to do a book on the state of jazz in the new millennium, which I thought was a nice sort of kind of theme because, you know, millennium was, in, you know, that was the buzz, you know, in the, in the years immediately after the new millennium. Um, and I told him what I wanted to do. Uh, my first book, which came out in 1989, um, was a book on jazz in the 1980s, and that had sold very well, which he, he knew about, uh, obviously working with him before. And he was quite excited by the idea. And so we came up with a working title, uh, Jazz in the New Millennium, very original. Uh, this was January 2000, and I agreed to deliver the finished manuscript in January 2003. Uh, a bit ambitious, a bit ambitious. Uh, once I began, I, I realized the project would take a huge amount of research. In the event, the book comprised of 241 pages of text, into which was crammed 243 bibliographical re references, and extracts from 115 uh, interviews which I conducted. So looking back, it's no surprise I didn't have the January 2003 deadline, which in turn was extended and extended and extended and until finally my editor friend flew, flew across from New York to London, took me out for a nice meal, sat me down, and he said, uh, we must have this book completed by February 2005, end of story. So the idea was, the, the idea, in fact, was to put my book out for the Christmas trade in 2005, since Christmas is the only time, he said, really, that jazz books sell in the United States. Then he dropped a bit of a bombshell. He said they were putting out, at the same time as my book, a book called Is Rock Dead? And uh, 
he said that their marketing people had decided to change the title of my book from Jazz in the New Millennium, which I quite liked, to Is Jazz Dead? Uh, in the hope of collecting some extra sales uh, on the back of the rock book. Now, one of the problems of working with a major publisher is you've got no control over your, what your book is called. You can suggest the title, but um, this, this is not the case with small publishers or university presses, incidentally. They, they usually respect the author's uh, wishes regarding title, but big publishers, lots of money involved, the contract actually st st stipulates that they've got control over title. If their marketing department can come up with another title which they think will help sell more books, so <coughs> And I was in no real position to complain because I'd run over my deadline several times. And if you run over your deadline, theoretically, the contract, they can cancel the contract and demand the advance back, which was quite a nice sum, and I'd already spent it, so it would be embarrassing. <laughs> um, I did protest, though, I did protest. Since nowhere in the book did I so much as suggest Jazz had caught a cold, never mind was dying or was dead. To me, the title sounded a little bit old hat. I mean, we all know, I mean, as, as early as 1920, um, that's three years after the first jazz record was made, uh, Musical America announced the funeral march of jazz. And Melody ma uh, magazine that same year uh, claimed that jazz today, we find, is dying a natural death. In 1922, Literary Digest headlined, Jazz is Played Out, while in 1926, the metronome headline inquired, is jazz coming or going? So I think it's fair to say, is jazz dead? It's not a particularly original title, one that I even thought was remotely suitable for my book. Needless to say, this cap cut absolutely no ice with the publishers in New York. The decision had been made, that was that. However, they did agree to add, or has it moved to a new address? Since I pointed out the key chapter in the book was about the globalization of jazz. And surely this was the new address which jazz had moved to, the, the global address. I felt this m much was at least undeniable. Uh, none of us would be here today, for example, if, if jazz, like baseball, had remained essentially an American pursuit. So the book came out in the USA in October 2005, and within 12 weeks it had sold out. The editor told me, quite amusingly, that it was helping the rock book sales, which, which no one in their right mind would have predicted just a few months before. Even more surprisingly, uh, people began to assume that the new address was Europe. Even when I clearly say in the foreword, it's there in black and white, that in discussing the effects of globalization in jazz, I use an ex Europe as an example. Obviously, that's where I come from, that's what I know most about. But I could have equally used Brazilian jazz, South African township jazz, Australian jazz, Cuban jazz, Afro-Cuban jazz. Fantastic examples of the global globalization effect, Argentinian jazz or even Russian jazz, which is completely off the wall. Um, to me, the effects of globalization on jazz today is the single most important development in the music today. It's not just another engaging story or a sign of the music's growing acceptance. It's the main story, the overwhelming trend, the key evolutionary development that's taking the music into the future. Let's place that in context. To do that, let's, let's look at the effect of globalization in the real world, not the world of jazz, but the real world, where for the last 60 years, American politicians and diplomats traveled the world, pushing countries to open their markets, free up their politics and their currencies, embrace free trade and take up the challenge of global globalization by competing in the global marketplace. And it worked. Several countries took advantage of globalization and have become rather good at it. So much so that in the USA, the National Intelligence Council's latest global trend review is called a transformed world. And it concluded that the USA was now becoming a less dominant power because of globalization. The global system was moving towards a multipolar world. Now this represents a huge dramatic shift away from the unipolar moment the USA, the USA enjoyed after the fall of the Berlin Wall and two decades of unchallenged American supremacy that followed. 
Now, the speed of this transformation has been astonishing. Whereas the elder George Bush was once concerned about the possible collapse of Russia, the younger George Bush was con concerned about excessive Russian power. A new world has come into being almost unnoticed, thanks to globalization. Emerging markets like China, India, and Brazil now account for 40% of the world's economy. Now, this is not about American decline so much as uh, the rest of the world catching up. So let's give you an example of what I mean by that. 30 years ago in tennis, Americans made up half the draw in the US Open, numbering 128 players in all. In 207, only 20 Americans made the draw. Now, American sports commentators were up in arms. They demanded to know why had America fallen so fast? Why are we doing so badly? But it wasn't that America was suddenly doing badly at all. The rest of the world was catching up. In 2007, the final 16 players of the US Open came from 10 different countries. Pushing that just a little further, in his influential study, American Ascendancy, How the United States Gained and Wielded Power, Michael H. Hunt concluded that Western Europe and Japan have drawn alongside the United States in their technological capacity, their income levels, their capital resources, and in the depth and integration of their home markets. He concluded they need no longer look to the United States for leadership in these areas. So I don't think it's unreasonable to suggest that if globalization can result in other countries catching up the USA in industry, trade, and finance, in this humble little world of jazz of ours, we, it may be possible that other countries are also catching up in the United States. After all, jazz went global in 1917, and from the 1970s, so did jazz education. The effect of jazz education has been profound, extremely profound, enabling young musicians beyond the shores of the United States to attain and realize their potential. You just have a fantastic example of that now. But so great has been the influence of the great jazz masters of jazz's golden years that it set in train a belief that evolutionary change in jazz must naturally emanate from within the land of its origin. Now, looking at this proposition dispassionately, there's no reason why this should be. Today, jazz has become too broad and too diverse to be changed by the revelations of one great man, as happened in jazz's golden years, when a teleological history was constructed around Louis Armstrong, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis, or like Common, John Coltrane, and so on. Back then, events inside the United States were far, far more compelling than events in the global forum, and they tended to fill the viewfinder. But today, with no single jazz musician dominating the 1980s, the 1990s, or the new millennium years, attention is now shifting gradually to fresh approaches, recombinations of existing knowledge, and hybridized versions of jazz in the global arena. Now here, certain disjunctures between economy, culture, and politics, and nation states, have produced a variety of approaches to jazz performance. Such transformations have occurred gradually, with some local jazz musicians seeking an expressionism as much rooted in local influences as the conventions and traditions of American jazz. In these examples, jazz is deterritorialized and expressed in terms of the local rather than global values. American influences are present, but so too are influences from local cultures. Yesterday, for example, uh, we heard uh, Erling play um, Jan Garbrecht, playing in a style that you know, we dissociate, I suppose, with Dexter Gordon. So the language is there, but what is happening, he is then bringing in local influences. So here a musician has used an American cultural language and its associated cultural codes, and to this extent you could say they've been Americanized, but in drawing on an American cultural repertoire, they made it own by introducing their own cultural codes. So Americanization is not an accurate description of what is going on now, since the global influence has been transformed by the local. So to this extent, American jazz has gone global, but it's also been localized to the point it now represents a significant development in the development of jazz.
Of course, these events are at odds with the teleological great man theory, you know, around which jazz has been constructed. And the temptation is to see hybridized or localized versions of jazz in isolation. But if we aggregate all forms of localized or globalized jazz, Brazilian jazz, South African township jazz, Argentinian jazz, Australian jazz, French jazz, Spanish and Catalonian jazz, German jazz, Norwegian jazz, Swedish jazz, British jazz, Russian jazz, Hungarian jazz, Indian jazz, Finnish jazz, and even jazz from Iceland and the Faroe Islands, a significant trend begins to emerge. This is not to say these versions of jazz are somehow better than American jazz, only to suggest that because of localization or globalization, they contain certain properties that are not present in American jazz, and some audiences find these interesting. Now, I should emphasize at this point, I have no quarrel with a prescriptivist view of jazz by those loyal to history and or economic power who, irrespective of nationality, believe the only true way in which jazz should be played is the American way. Like all art forms, it's vital to preserve a sense of its own history, which uh, Francesco was talking about yesterday. It's vital to preserve a sense of jazz's own history and where it came from. But speaking personally, the most exciting developments in jazz today are coming from the descriptivists, who have taken something from a global source and through complex contacts of accommodation, emulation and or resistance have reinterpreted, recast and transformed the music in a way that jazz has become part of their own cultural repertoire. Of course, it's natural for the prescriptivists to question the authenticity of jazz played outside the, the mother tongue context of American styles. From this standpoint, jazz has a fixed identity representing something intrinsically American. Yet jazz has become a global music because American culture has become hegemonic to the world. Just as youth culture in local contexts see McDonald's as part of their own cultural repertoire, jazz musicians in local contexts see jazz as part of their culture through the lived experiences of playing the music in a way that makes sense of their own local cultural and socio-musical surroundings. Yesterday, Bjorn talked about the local influences in Jan Garbrecht's style. Spanish musicians are incorporating flamenco into their music. Finnish musicians are inspired by the Kabbalah. Hungarian musicians are incorporating gypsy influences. In Italy, Italy John Luigi Teresi says if Duke Ellington can be inspired by Harlem, then he can be inspired by his beloved hometown of Bergamo. In the UK, John Sermon has done several albums reflecting the influence of England's West Country, beginning in the 1970s with an album called, perhaps unsurprisingly, Westering Home. Several Scottish musicians have incorporated Scottish folkloric elements into their, into their jazz. And now this is a list that can go on and on and on. Of course, the man who helped start all this, the localization of jazz, was Jan Johansson who made an album of folk tunes taken from Svenska Lata, the national collection of Swedish folk tunes, called Jazz Par Svenska, which he recorded between 1961 and 1962. Now, a key point here is that the process of localization in jazz responds to the need for identity. And in the era of political turmoil and complex negotiations of personal and cultural identity, we know that globalization destroys boundaries and in the process raises fears about the loss of our cultural anchors and identity. It's interesting to reflect that one of the side effects of globalization, and no one can explain this, there's no explanation for this, one of the side effects of globalization has seen an increase in nationalism and tribalism and a proliferation of struggles for independence, the Arab Spring, for example, <coughs> proliferation of uh, devolution, self-determination, and a resurgence of concern about ethnicity and cultural identity in almost all corners of the world. We don't have to be reminded of the tragic events here in Norway, for example. Just because every, everyone everywhere wants to wear Nike trainers and drink Coca-Cola doesn't mean to say they are any less fiercely concerned about their cultural identity. Indeed, as we've seen all over the world, people are prepared to fight and die for it. The increasing globalization of jazz is a global jazz community's response to this. 
providing a means for local musicians around the world to assert their cultural identity and place within the music, whether subconsciously felt or explicitly stated. I've lost count of the number of people, the number of musicians I've interviewed here in Europe. It's a lot. Times are changing, and they, they really are changing fast. In the past, I've been privileged to speak to the likes of Duke Ellington, would you believe it? Count Basie, Norman Grants, Artie Shaw, Woody Herman, Coleman Hawkins, Stan Kenton. Jimmy McPartland told me about seeing Louis Armstrong and King Oliver and the Creole Jazz Band in uh, Chicago in the early 1920s. Artie Shaw told me about playing with Big Spiderbeck and seeing the Paul Whiteman Orchestra in 1928 with Beiderbeck in the trumpet section. I've spoken to Benny Carter, who told me about playing with Billie Holiday, trumpeted Chris, Chris Griffin about performing in Carnegie Hall with the Benny Goodman Orchestra in 1938. John Lewis of the Modern Jazz Quartet told me about witnessing Charlie Parker's New York debut with Jane McShann Orchestra in 1941. I spent a day with Mario Bowser, and Mario Bowser is the guy who kicked off Afro-Cuban jazz. I've spoken to Ahmed Jamal about sitting on the same piano stool as Art Tatum and sharing 16s, 8s, and 4s with him. I've spoken to Bet Betty Carter, Carmen McRae, and Nancy Wilson. And I've spoken to McCoy Tyner about playing with John Coltrane. These are experiences I will always treasure because I've learned from them. Jazz history from the giants who made jazz history. But in this respect, that era of golden, uh, uh, that golden era of jazz is now dead. That we can be certain about. It's alive only in history books and on recordings. Today, if we were to look where the future of the music lies, it would be to the diversity of individual contributors on the global stage. And I often hear people complain that the contemporary jazz scene has not thrown up any great men of the stature of those from jazz's golden years. But it seems to me there's a very profound reason for this. It's because they're no longer needed. The great age of the jazz virtuoso is over. As we've seen at this festival, every young musician under the age of 25 is a great jazz virtuoso. Today, today the challenge is in creating an effective context uh, in which to function as a jazz musician. So composing is beginning to take over from uh, the long, long solos. The message is clear. Every man must be his own leader. The knowledge is out there now. Today he knows enough to, not to follow other people. Now these are exciting times for jazz. No one under the age of 45 has witnessed evolutionary change in jazz, but it's now happening through the localization of the music. So let's make the most of it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, early. We, we've only got to four o'clock, by the way. Okay. I'll be long. It's about uh, this uh, uh, demand for progress that I, I'm not sure that I understand because um, one of the great things about our time is that many times can live side by side. And like in classical music, we have access to all that classical music is still being played and it's terrible in the sense that it's uh, being, uh, it's, the canon is being reproduced over and over again. But it's also good because it exists side by side with all the new development. And what I hear, I might, might be wrong, but what I hear you saying is that all these traditional jazz uh, styles, why can't they exist side by side with the modern styles or the new styles or the new... Well, of course they are. I actually said in, in, the, in the thing, I think you misunderstood me, or, or otherwise I'm not making myself clear. It's just, I, I, there's no quarrel at all with, with the, the, the guys who feel they want to play in American styles and, or various styles. Absolutely no quarrel at all. I think it's great. I actually said that jazz has got to have a sense of its own history. It's got to know where it's come from. But it is going somewhere. It is, it is changing. I mean, the whole history of classical music. You use classical music, for example. You know, how do you get from how do you, how do you get from Bach to the Darmstadt School? through a series of evolutionary changes. I mean, that, that, this is art, this is what's happening at the moment. 
So no, I'm not saying, not in any way at all. If I, made, if, if I didn't make myself clear, then I'm making myself clear now. That's, that's all these styles do exist side by side. I mean, I enjoy I a place called Bristol, which uh, Nod will know. Uh, there's a place where they play traditional jazz every Friday night. And on occasion, I've gone down there if I've been shopping in Bristol or something like that. And they play really, really good traditional jazz. Trad jazz. You know, it's great. If, it's, it's, if you're part of the atmosphere, having a couple of beers, that, that's great. I really enjoy it, you know. But it's not the sort of music I want to bottle and take home. Choose to listen to my own choice. If I want a good evening out, though, that's a good evening out, you know. But, you know, there are many ways in which we consume music today. And this, this is another area which is, I think is worth thinking about, you know. Um, when John Coltrane was recording live at the Village Vanguard, was all his audience stone cold sober listening to him? I don't think so. I mean, the, 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 the effect of his music that, 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 had on his, had on, that it had on people has kind of transcended the kind of, uh, you, you speak to people who, who were witnessing Coltrane at the time, they said it was transcendent, incredible experience, you know. But it, they wouldn't be there at nine o'clock in the morning on Monday morning saying, here's your John Coltrane lesson. You get an extremely different buzz. So the way in which we consume music affects how we make judgments about it. And, and, and that's an important thing too. But I think one of the most immediate things and most immediately apparently obvious to me is, is um, the localization thing. Now people might say that, okay, um, you know, there's just about two or three musicians in Finland who are really sort of, you know, taking inspiration from the Kavala and maybe about ten musicians in Spain who are playing flamenco stuff, you know, it's, you know, that, that's not a real trend, is it? But if you, if you look at the way jazz history has been constructed, take the big band here, for example. Who do we talk about when we talk about the big band here? We talk about Duke Ellington, we talk about Count Basie, we talk about Benny Goodman, we talk about Chip Webb. Uh, Jimmy Lunsford, uh, and then Cap Calloway, maybe, because Dizzy Gillespie paid in it. Then the list comes, it's quite a, it's quite a short list. Um, no one ever talks about Jan Savitz, or uh, Ben Burney, or Alvino Ray, or Guy Lombardo. These people are consigned to the dustbin of history. History is constructed around where it's happening, where it's at. And if you take the musicians where, where it's actually happening, it's where it's at, uh, in terms of localization, that's where the changes are happening. That's where they're happening now. They're actually happening now. We can witness evolutionary change. It's very, very exciting. Well, we uh, have to soon stop this discussion. Sure. Because Here's one more. One more. Okay. <laughs> I just want to follow up on that because um, I agree with the discussion of the jazz history and, you know, like Scott Dewar has pointed out very well how, how we, the mythology of the jazz the history of jazz is. But what I'm thinking is there is something, um, there's an analysis of the music itself that is missing in a way because uh, that people express themselves differently and um, pick up uh, Ethnic uh, the different sources doesn't necessarily it changes the surface of the music very often. But one of the things that has happened in the history of jazz is that some people have gone into the music and really changed the basic language of music. Uh, like yeah, well, but just just one more. This is really, really it's like Danny Tristano said: there are artists and there are uh, characters. Um, in, in the history of music. And with characters he means those that takes the music, the language as a core language and comments it. And then you have those that really go in and change the language, which are the real artists. I mean, this is very black and white from Lenny's side, but it's, uh, it's uh, thought-provoking because there, there is this acceptance of any kind of comment and, or new color as something new, while it's in fact just a comment. You can't have it both ways. You know, I, 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 <laughs> either the change is happening or change isn't happening. Change most definitely is happening. Um, when you say that, uh, that there's been no fundamental change, well, no, because um, 
the music is music. There's only 12 tones, and you can only do so much with it. And in the Western world. Pardon? In the Western world. In the Western world. <laughs> in the Western world. Well, we're in the Western world, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. yeah. Is Tron time here in the Western world? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 we're not going to get the same degree of profound change that you might get uh, moving from, uh, you know, let's say the big band era to the small group, very improvisationally based bebop that came, you know, in the mid-40s, or the kind of the free jazz that, that began to burst out in the beginning of the 60s. Those, those are very fundamental changes, and I do take your point there. But there's only so much, you know, uh, leeway which you've got with music, because these musicians, so big in their own way, they filled out, they've really, as I, I used the phrase earlier on, they filled the viewfinder. Uh, they don't leave very much uh, room for innovation. You, the, and, and I think really, in terms of, if you're looking for uh, changes, sea changes in innovation, um, in classical music, you know, they're, 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 you, you have the same kind of thing, unless it's a major thing going from, as I say, the post-romantics into the dance at school. Um, that, that is a major change, I take, I take your point there. But beyond that, there were still changes, you know, occurring within the music. They, they, they weren't seismic changes. And I think if you're looking for seismic changes, you, 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 that's simply not going to happen again in jazz, because we've seen it all, you know. I mean, you look at Russian jazz, you know, the, some of it is so free and, and outre and, and recondite that it uh, gives you indigestion even to think about it. So uh, those kind of dramatic changes are now not possible. But, but what you will get is, is changes within the kind of um, uh, sine waves of jazz as, as, as it progresses through the decades. I'm sorry to uh, just stop there. Maybe you have to go further on this yeah. discussion. And Thank you very much. People that have questions. Thank you so much for uh, your